Liar, liar, pants on fire. That's a common saying that echoes across many childhoods, and that, that carries a great deal of weight because well, none of us wants to be known as a liar. As a kid, you generally trust what anyone tells you, and the day that you first find out that someone lied to you, well, it's, it's devastating. It hurts more than a skin knee or a chipped tooth. I mean, someone that you trusted deceived you. But it's also usually more than that. See, the way that you saw the world and the way that you thought that the world worked all determine how you yourself behave. When that changes, you change. If you believe in Santa Claus, you're up at the crack of dawn and you rush downstairs Christmas morning just to see what present Santa left. But if you don't believe in him, well, you know, maybe they'll just sleep in a bit longer that day. Now, the way that we perceive our world determines our beliefs and our opinions and our actions. But what if what we know about our world, about our society and about ourselves isn't true? What if the world we think exists doesn't? Would you want to know? I mean, would you be able to handle the truth? Or would you cling to the lies because, well, it's easier not to change? Whenever the big questions in life come up, a lot of emotions and controversy, they come up too. People, well, they hold on to their view of the world very tightly because if that changes, then they might have to change as well. Francis Bacon, the 16th century statesman and scientist, wisely wrote, people prefer to believe what they prefer to be true. But often people would prefer that nothing be true. It argues that since we all base our truth on perception and since all of us see and process things differently, well, then nothing is in fact really true. Often in courtrooms like this one, people will debate what is right or wrong or good or evil, but unless you can actually establish that there is such a thing as truth, everything else is pointless. We live in this world right now which is called postmodernism. You know, you have your view of truth and I have my view of truth and she has her view of truth and he has his view of truth. The problem with that is it sounds really good but it simply does not work. But when you think about what truth is, it, truth has to be something that corresponds with reality. You can say, in my mind, I think I have a million dollars in the bank. And you can go to a teller in the bank and say, I have a million dollars. And she can say, no. And you can say, well, that's your view of truth. It's not my view of truth. But you're not getting a million dollars. Truth, said Winston Churchill, is the most valuable thing in the world. It is so valuable that it is often covered by a bodyguard of lies. And it was Andrei Sakharov, uh, who there was a great Russian physicist who gave the Russians the atomic bomb. Before he died, he said, I always thought the bomb was the most powerful weapon in the world. I've changed my mind. The most powerful weapon in the world is the truth. Truth has a long reach because it tells what reality is, not what you choose to make it to be. What I believe to be true is gonna alter my everyday life. It's gonna determine on who I marry, um, how I'm going to raise my kids, where I'm going to live, what I watch on television, what I spend my money upon. Truth is still truth. Um, truth is exclusive. This is very important in, in the pluralistic age. It, it, it offends many people. If something is true, something else is untrue. Uh, for example, if, if something is black, it's not white. Uh, if a religion is true, an alternative religion is not true. If you couldn't speak or say something intelligent about uh, the notion of truth, people would have assumed you had, you know, you were weak-minded in some way. Today, it's uh, often considered a badge of open-mindedness to say that there's no such thing as truth. It's popular to say that there is no truth because it allows people really to go their own way. Reality is a tough taskmaster. When people want to live the way they want to live and they want to be blind to the consequences of their actions and so on, you start to call into question uh, the idea of truth or knowledge or reality. Society lives with truth and lives to its own advantage. When you're on the wrong end of any assertion and interaction, then the lie 
and the violation of truth becomes very obvious when you're exonerating yourself by not binding yourself to the terms to which you've committed yourself, then all of a sudden it becomes perspectival. In fact, we, we live our lives as if that stuff exists constantly. Uh, people can call it, call it an illusion all day long, but they live like it's real. Truth is that which corresponds to reality as it is. Truth generally has at least two broad tests. It has a correspondence test and a coherence test. Correspondence applies to particular claims. Coherence is a test that applies to a series of claims. As complex as that sounds, we apply this in every court of law. You test correspondence and coherence where your claim is being challenged by somebody else. We do it in contracts, we do it in marriages, we do it in science, we do it in philosophy, we do it in our day-to-day -day living. We do it even with our monetary system. The truth is something that is not a matter of opinion. It's something that um, you put forward as a fact, which can also be objectively verified in most cases, whether through documentation, through witnesses, that kind of thing. Truth would conform to that which is real. It conforms to reality. It's not the opposite way around. I, I, in layman's terms, truth is telling it like it is. We recognize that everybody brings a bias to the historical record. Everyone brings a bias to a truth claim. But I think it's still important to recognize that we can analyze those truth claims and understand whether or not they make sense. Something is either true or it's not. You can think that I'm a good looking blonde of 18 years old, and uh, you can think that all day long, and you can tell your friends that, and you can get everybody, but when, when I walk in the room, I'm still gonna be an old fat man. It's just the way it works. I liken it to a culture that says, well, I don't believe in gravity. It's against my feelings. I think I can fly. And we even come up with a song, you know, I believe I can fly, I believe I can touch the sky. And we get up on the top of the building and we join hands together and we create a whole no gravity movement. And we dive off. Gravity wins gravity win. If truth is perceived, then even that perception of truth is a perception. So it is either making a truth claim or it is making a perception claim. There is this idea if you tell a lie often enough, it will be believed. Yeah, that, that, that's certainly true. And the Hitlerian regime did this. If you often enough say that the Jewish people, are, are gypsies are subhuman, uh, people will believe it. That doesn't make it true. The truth was taught according to science that the world was flat. Did truth change once we established the fact that the world was round? No. But our idea of that which is true changed. Truth does not change. I've always enjoyed it on radio and TV when you argue with someone and then they say, you know, th th there's no such thing as absolute truth. And I always come back, uh, are you absolutely sure? Uh, <laughs> they never mean there's no absolute truth. What they mean is, I don't like the truth you have just uttered. Would you really want a pilot who's got all accurate instruments in front of him but would rather go with perspective? Would you really want a doctor who's got all the instruments measuring your blood pressure and your heartbeat and your pulse and all of this, but say, it's my perspective that is contrary to all of this. To deny an absolute is to posit an abs absolute. Such people say, hey, well, that's your truth and I have my truth. I would say, well, that's true. And what's true for me is that you're wrong. So who's right? Or you shouldn't judge. Well, is that your judgment? If you shouldn't judge, then why are you judging my judgment? Or, you know what, nobody's right. I say, are you sure nobody's right? If there's no such thing as truth, why print money? If there's no such thing as truth, why obey the laws of the road? If there's no such thing as truth, why take anybody at their word? There is not a definition to what is truth if each individual can come up with it. There has to be an outside source. As a Christian, we have to go to the Bible, which transcends time. Because if there is no benchmark, if there's no distance, no, no dividing point between truth and lies, then there can be no definition for good and evil. Because if I do something that's very evil but I want to do it, then I'll just call it good. And since, uh, there's no, since the truth and the lie is the issue, good and evil become secondary. 
In court cases, the revealed truth can set the innocent free and condemn the guilty. See, that's the thing about truth. It has consequences. And people generally don't like consequences. Celebrated American author Mark Twain said, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. Lies are often comfortable, they're easy to pass on and easy to believe. This is especially evident when discussing our human nature. Everyone likes to think of themselves as mostly good. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if all of us just naturally did the right thing? Think about what a world like that would look like and then compare that to the world around us right now. The most empirically verifiable fact about human, the human condition, is the depravity of man. It is at once the most intellectually resisted, at the same time that it is the most empirically verifiable. So said Malcolm Muggeridge. How can one deny the depravity of man? You really can't come to terms with history without understanding that human beings are in some way twisted. We got a dark streak in us. It's the only possibility of understanding the flow of human history. Now that doesn't mean that human beings can't do good things. They do good things all the time. I bet you, I'll bet you Adolf Hitler treated Eva Braun, his mistress, in a glorious fashion when they were out on a date. We're not born moral people. You, know, you have to teach a baby not to bite. You have to teach a baby not to steal. You have to teach a baby to share. The world thinks that we're born good and we somehow through our environment we turn bad. And that, that violates everything that you can observe. But you are born into an arena that you will not escape and that the brokenness of mankind, the flesh, will gravitate towards that because the flesh always wants to be fed. Whereas goodness doesn't need to be fed, goodness needs to be shared. <laughs> under the rubric of humanism, under the rubric and teaching of communism, we killed more people in the 20th century than all the other centuries combined. We don't see that man is noble. We do not see that human beings are good. Instead, we see that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I think if people were inherently good, the world, we, we wouldn't need government. Uh, we wouldn't need kings. We wouldn't need rulers. I think. Uh, one of our founding fathers said, if all men were angels, you wouldn't need a law. So when, when somebody says, you know, I'm a good person, what they generally mean is compared to dot, dot, dot. And it's usually this person or that person. So the standard of comparison for us as people is often people. People generally don't like rules. And they like to do what they want to do when they want to do it. We're all like little spoiled children. When someone steals their wallet, for example, they're a universalist, stealing is wrong. But when it comes to their own um, social or sexual or moral behavior, they want to get away with something, uh, suddenly all morals are relative. So it's handy for people to believe in relativism. It makes them feel free from uh, what they think of as oppression by others, you know, especially people of a religious nature who might, you know, uh, shake their finger at them. Now you can say that you're a relativist, but you don't live your life like that because you would not hire a babysitter to take care of your kids if he's gonna do with that which is right in his own eyes. If I can lie and get away with it, if I can do something that is gratifying to my own flesh and get away with it, you wouldn't hire a bookkeeper to take care of your, uh, the numbers or your bank account. Somebody who's gonna do that which is right in their own eyes. Truth is up to the beholder, absolutely not. Truth is outside of ourselves. It has to be. I mean, how do you know if you're good or evil apart from God? I mean, you would know whether or not what you were doing brought positive or negative sanctions. You would know whether a behavior provides you with a good result or a bad result, because you can tell, you know, because that's, you know, preferences. But as far as knowing whether or not you're good or bad apart from God, what, what, what are you using for a benchmark? You know, we, I, know I'm, I know I'm a sinner because I don't, I don't fit the definition of good. I fit my definition of good. I fit it perfectly. Everybody else falls short. Well, if you look at the dictionary, I think it gives 48 definitions of the word good. Um, some might think they're good because, well, I used to be a rapist, but I haven't raped anyone for six months. I'm a good man. You know, I haven't robbed a bank for three years. I'm a good person. Uh, guarantee the mafia think they're, I'm a good father. 
you know, I'm breaking your legs, but I'm a good father. So the definitions of good vary. Why can't I just be good and choose to do what I choose to do as good? It's a privilege we will never give our neighbor unless he or she conforms to our definition of good. It's as simple as that. As a matter of fact, Richard Dawkins has gone on record saying, we live in a universe which has no good, no evil, just blind, pitiless indifference. If he's right, why is everybody railing against right and wrong? Forget about morality for a second. Just, you, you know, let, let's use the example of a soccer game. How could you possibly have a soccer game without having any rules or guidelines for people to, to play within, right? Um, you only have to read Lord of the Flies as an example of the uh, sort of extreme end of uh, that way of thinking. Um, we do need an external moral code. We have a, a criminal code set up in this country uh, to deal with uh, proper legal actions. People are always trying to get around that system. And, you know, if, if we didn't need that system, why don't we just remove the criminal code? If law gets to determine what is right and wrong, then what Adolf Hitler did was acceptable. He wrote the laws. Did you know, actually, the tribunal that held the Third Reich to, to what they did as being morally wrong by killing six million Jews, blacks, Christians, and gypsies, their excuse was society told us that it is okay. What is he saying? By and large, within our society, it is acceptable behavior to eliminate this lower caste group of people. If you try to have a society without an external moral code. Uh, one example of that would be communism. Communism is a legal system without a moral or religious system backing it. And everyone can see that that system has never been able to work. We want to begin to think critically. We have to think outside of ourselves. We have to fall back upon an objective standard of good and bad, right and wrong, sacred and secular. And scripture alone is the only book that is able to transcend time and help us to do that very thing. There's a huge body of uh, facts and situations in our society which we can all agree are inherently good or bad. And when you really look at them, you can, you can boil them back in history to basically the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, such as the, the Ten Commandments. Our whole society is predicated on these principles. Our whole system of government, our entire legal system, our social system, our families, our relationships are all predicated on those basic principles. I've asked thousands of people, not hundreds, but thousands of people, do you consider yourself to be a good person? And I've heard the same answer for almost every person. Yes, I'm a very good person. Why? Because Proverbs 20 verse 6 says, most every man will proclaim his own goodness. And the reason he does this is because he goes about to establish his own righteousness, being ignorant of the righteousness which is of God. While we may not always do good, we all want to look good. It's human nature to want to be liked by others. So when it comes to speaking the truth and hurting someone's feelings or telling a lie and keeping everyone happy, we usually choose the latter. Being plain and respectful is a good thing, but are there times when that goes too far? The political correctness movement that began in the 1980s attempted to ban all hurtful terms and phrases and discriminatory practices, but who decides what is actually hurtful versus merely a difference of opinion or well-meaning advice? How is a moral code and truth affected by the premise that no one should ever be offended? I think probably the two most misused words in the English language are offended and awesome. <laughs> I love the I am offended approach. You know, I, I'm offended, therefore I am, which is the, the rallying cry of, of the 21st century West. People think that uh, being offended is unacceptable. Every time England loses a soccer game, I'm offended. <laughs> yes, lost my hair. I was offended, and we don't use the language properly today. I find that very offensive. I had this said to me many times when I just state an opinion that someone disagrees with. I find that offensive. They don't mean that. What they mean is, I disagree with you. And I think at some point as a society, we have to make a decision. What is more important? My right to speak my view or the other person's right not to hear it? And I, I think that basically our charter of, of rights and freedoms has guaranteed us the freedom of expression. We should be able to use that without being shamed or ostracized into going along with the status quo. Uh, you know, if, if you follow that absurdity down its logical 
path to its conclusion, you end up with a 1984 type scenario where uh, people are, are saying things that aren't true or saying things that don't make any sense just for the simple reason that they're trying to please others or to please the system. There are no genuine rules as to what is offensive and what isn't. It's, it's, very, it's arbitrary and subjective by its nature. And it has to be. Political correctness wants to define on yours and my behalf what it deems to be good and bad. I think that there is a great cultural uh, suppression of freedom of speech in every way in the United States. I think that there are genuinely there are people uh, who are afraid to say what they really believe because they could get turned down for a research grant or they might get at an academic institution they may lose a promotion if they if they say what they really want to say and what's really in their heart. And wherever there's truth someone's going to be offended. Uh, that's why that's why in today's culture we have postmodernism and uh, you don't want to offend people and so all beliefs are are, uh, are truth. All beliefs are true. But if there is truth and certainly that's what the Bible says then someone is going to be offended. You can't avoid it. If there's truth, then, then someone, it means that someone who doesn't believe that truth is in error. And that may be a hard pill to swallow. If you were to live by the premise that uh, you should try not to offend anyone all the time, you would never ever be able to succeed in that. Because what offends other people actually is their issue, not your issue. So uh, I do agree with the proposition that we shouldn't deliberately say things that are going to offend the sensibilities of other people. But there's also a limit on that. And that, that limit is what is the truth? What doesn't give me the right to say what's right or wrong? I'm not telling you, you must obey me. I'm throwing it out as a viewpoint. You have to decide whether you want to accept that invitation. There is an inherent value in speaking truth to people for their own good. Okay, so let me give you an example. If you are using a lot of drugs, okay, and I can see that this is having a destructive effect on your life, and I believe that this is wrong, am I helping you by not offending you and not saying anything? I think it was um, um, in the, the movie The Big Lebowski uh, where uh, he hears an opinion and his his tagline is, well, that's like your opinion, man. And, you know, that's true. We have to respect each other. And I have to respect other people's opinion as well. But somebody's right <laughs> and somebody isn't. And um, I think the challenge for all of us is, is to really be honest with ourselves and then to be honest with what is right. The political correctness are become the cops of what's offensive. And it doesn't take much. It takes one person. If one person at a school says, I'm not a God-believing person and I'm offended because my child attends a school and you're going to have a, a, a nativity play at the school. And we all know the stories where one parent has created a decision for all. Some views are politically correct and some views are politically incorrect. And thus, I have a right to say that I'm offended by your views about men, about women, about blacks, about anti-Semitism, whatever it might be, because those are not right. It was a way to kind of smuggle back into this view of relativism some kind of set of absolutes to actually set aside certain views. In political correctness, certainly anything of a uh, faith-based value is automatically branded, you know, as a public viewpoint as offensive. But, you know, if uh, Wiccans wanted to come in and celebrate, uh, you know, an earth circle, that would be okay. We'll embrace that because spirituality is groundless. Christian faith is grounded. If I practice something that's groundless, it still allows the state to be God. If I practice something that's grounded outside of the state, then it goes counter to what they want to achieve. Everybody has a worldview. Everybody has a perspective. The question is whether or not you have a right to that view is not based upon your emotional reaction or repulsion to it. The reaction should be, is it true or is it not? Christianity can be offensive partly because it's so exclusionary. I mean, it is completely exclusionary. There is no room in Christianity for any other path to salvation, any other God. Uh, so if, if you don't accept Jesus as who he is, 
then as far as the world sees Christianity, they're excluded. What I think is fascinating about it is they're excluded from a hell they don't believe in, and they're mad because they don't get to go to heaven they don't believe in. If you notice worldwide, it's okay to be an animist and worship animals and rocks. It's okay to worship uh, Buddha or Vishnu. Uh, it's okay to be into Islam, but it's always Christianity that is demonized and you're not allowed to say your book has the truth. You're not allowed to go out and speak about it. Uh, you need to shut up. Well, I have always in life noticed that whatever is really true is what's being attacked. There are many statements that someone could be offended by. And many of those statements could actually be true. In fact, true statements will usually be considered more offensive just because they are true. Calling someone a liar when they haven't lied is just frustrating. Calling someone a liar when they're actually caught in a lie, well, that has the power of conviction and condemnation behind it. One of the most dangerous topics to speak the truth about could be the so-called battle of the sexes. The evident fact of someone's gender immediately puts them on one side or the other. And since Adam and Eve, battle has been raging. Women are clearly better. Uh, make sure my wife knows I said that. I mean, is it, is, it, is it really that hard to understand that men and women just visually are different? And yet there are those who want us to believe that we aren't. Of course, there's differences. There's all kinds of anatomical differences uh, there. But there are also psychological differences as well between males and females. Not wrong, just different. And that does not create inequality, but that's the fear. When they did a study on the human brains, and they found out men and women's brains are very different. If you're female, you've got a multitask brain. If you're female, your emotional brain is far more developed than your logical brain. If you're male, your aggressive brain is far more developed. And logically, you face, you face things a lot differently. There's been a competition between men and women to say, I can do anything a man can do, I can do anything a woman can do, and it's been a bunch of bunk, and it's really caused a lot of trouble in marriages. The whole thrust of the feminist movement uh, was based around equality, and in its early days there was much that was noble about it. There's something beyond, which is, which is gender feminism, which is, is, is obsessed with the idea that there are no differences between men and women. But at every single level there are, we, we have four children, two daughters, and uh, you just see it as children grow up. The research is really bearing out what any parent can tell you. If you know a parent or if you are a parent of a boy and a girl, you can see from the very get-go that they're different. So a lot of the parents of the 1970s and 80s who said, gee, I'm going to give my boys dolls to play with, found that the boys were taking the Barbie and turning her legs and using her as a gun. And when they gave the girls trucks to play with, they found that they were using the bed of the trucks as a cradle to put their dolls in. In conceptual terms, men and women are equal. I agree with that. But equal does not mean identical. It does not mean identical in gifting. It does not mean identical in abilities, roles, responsibilities, etc. Equal does not mean the same. In fact, there are lots of situations in life where treating men and women equally may mean that we don't treat them exactly the same. I think for some people it's very uncomfortable to say that there are things that women do and that they do better than men. There are things that men do and that they do better than women. That I think flies in the face of what a lot of people envision as sort of an egalitarian or equal society, this notion that we're not all identical. Now that doesn't mean that we need to value one more highly than the other. And uh, it's quite interesting to look back because what you see the radicals decided to do was because they understood that there are real biological differences between men and women, um, they have to reverse that truth. And the way they reverse it is by denying their own femaleness. I think if you start treating men and women the same, you're going to lose the high points on both sides. You're going to lose um, on, the, on the male side. You're going to lose a lot of, I think, traditional masculinity, a lot of what make men strong. I think that women have a, a role in society that's a very special one. And uh, the ways that we're different from men uh, are strengths. You know, women are master negotiators. They're master peacemakers. 
um, would make wonderful world leaders and those differences should be celebrated, not try to stamp them down. I was in Kingston, Ontario and there was a student from Queen's University studying women, women's issues. She come up to me afterwards and say, said, why do you use all those sexist terms? And I said, what are they? Uh, woman, men, male, female, husband, wife. We're going to change the dictionary, you know. We're going to change the dictionary so there'll be no sexist words. This need to have women in the military. Now, women have always been in the military, but you know, those armies that have, have had the most experience of fighting have almost all concluded women shouldn't be in the front line for all sorts of reasons. Um, that uh, if a woman is hurt and a man is hurt, other men will rush to help the woman and leave the man. Um, that if it comes to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat, with some exceptions, a 120-pound woman will not fight as well as a 220-pound man. Um, emotional differences. If you say this, if you say that, how could you say such a thing? It's an entirely reasonable, viable comment to make. You're not saying women aren't equal, you're saying they're different. When researchers first research, uh, came up with this idea of fight or flight, they were studying male animals, and they found that in response to pain or fear, that male animals respond by fighting. They become more aggressive. And physiologically speaking, more, brain actually more blood actually flows into their brains. Women, in contrast, when they get into that situation of pain or fear, actually less blood flows into their brains. So they become more muddled, a little more confused. Now, this is not something that society can change. In fact, when researchers studied this, they found that 100% of males in pain had more blood to their brain, and 100% of females in pain had less blood to their brains. And what that means is that in those situations, in an emergency situation, I'd probably rather have a man running to the door to deal with the intruder than to have a woman in that situation. I think the problem is that um, in, in, in our drive as women to excel in society and to be able to do all the things that men do, somehow motherhood and making a home and being a good wife and all of those things has been lost in the shuffle. Those things are, are not really so much respected anymore. What scientists have discovered is that women, as probably doesn't surprise anyone, women are much more nurturing. Women have a much greater ability to, or interest in relating to other people. We find even in infants, that infants actually at the age of just a couple of days older, the girl infants are holding the gaze of their caregivers longer, so they actually want to look into the eyes of the person with them. Whereas the boys are, even at that early age, they're tracking motion, they're tracking movement, they're more interested in uh, uh, what's going on around them than forming those emotional bonds. It used to be that, um, you know, with my father, I could look at my father and say, well, uh, you know, here are the roles I occupy. But now when I look around me and I see women doing that, it, it's confusing. I think that it, it can have a tendency to um, make a man lethargic, uh, sort of give up. In any kind of a relationship, when one party starts to subsume all of the responsibility and all of the different roles within that relationship, whether it's a man and a wife, whether it's a mother and a child, it's, it's very unhealthy for both parties because after being relieved of all of the responsibility and the roles, the other party is left feeling useless. Think of a jigsaw puzzle, you know? All the puzzle pieces are essentially about the same size. They're equal in size, but they have different functions. You know, one piece is a part of the tree and another piece is a part of the cloud. So they have inequality in terms of their value of being here. There's probably no more powerful thing, relationship uh, in the world than, than a man and a woman working together. Despite how obvious something might be, like the differences between men and women, that hasn't stopped people from trying to argue the opposite. Isn't it telling that one of history's most deceptive and evil leaders said, the greater the lie, the greater the chance that it will be believed? That was Adolf Hitler. This, of course, would not be possible unless people willingly chose to ignore facts, logic, and common sense and support that lie. Cartoon character Homer Simpson sums it up well by saying, it takes two to lie, one to tell, one to listen. Now, in some cases, there might be a gray area where all the facts aren't known or where there are extenuating circumstances, but in others, all the information, evidence, and testimonies are clear, evident, and available, and yet, still a battle about the truth rages on.
the question, when does life begin, uh, is, is almost an idiotic question from the standpoint of science. I think a better question would be, what else is a fetus? You know, because if the question is, is a fetus a human being, at what point does it become a human being? Well, it becomes a human being at the point it can't become anything else. And there's not any point from the point where the sperm and the egg meet that it can ever become anything other than a human being. It, it, it's not going to become an aardvark or an artichoke or a, a chicken. It's going to be a human baby. Well, I hope that people understand how we decide, we being scientists, physicians, biologists, what's human. You know, you hear a lot of discussion about how do we, how do we define ourselves as human beings, and typically people talk about you know, things like our, our intelligence or our language. Um, and there are debates about those kinds of things. But there's one core principle by which we can define human beings. And it's, trans, it transcends everything else. And that is our human genome. It is unique for our species. There's no other organism that has that genome. And what makes us human is the expression of the information in our human genome. So that's why the beginning of human life is when the egg and the sperm come together. The egg contributes half the genome, the sperm contributes the other half of the genome, and you get a complete human genome. No one would dispute that anything that grows, where there's cell division, two cells become four and four become eight, that's alive. I, I, there, there is no other way to define it. That, that, that is a characteristic of life. Dead things don't, cells don't divide. Uh, when death, the instant death occurs, cells quit dividing. So the, scientifically speaking, the fetus from the moment of conception is alive and is human. There is no scientific argument about that. It is no longer a part of her, but it is still a human being. And unlike her skin cells, it started out as an egg and a sperm that came together, and that's what makes it a human being, even though it, it at that moment depends on her for survival. We have to distance ourselves from the truth. So we, we use euphemisms. We call the baby, newly conceived baby, a blob of tissue. Um, product, a menstrual extraction is another word for abortion. Um, a blood clot. Uh, but anything to distance ourselves from the truth, that there really is another human person developing. You know, the idea that abortion is a controversial view is in itself, you know, something that needs examination. You know, what is controversial about uh, not killing your children? Think of the, of the, of the propaganda machine, the, the effort, the money, the time, to completely turn the entire society's worldview around so far that they become, in, you know, the, the, that they favor infanticide as a, as a means of population control. I was so uh, filled with shame and guilt because I knew that I had crossed a line. When I laid on that table and the abortion began, um, I was convicted in my heart that what I was doing was wrong. And I felt powerless to stop it. And I had a, um, really what I would call a right order response to death. Uh, and it was death on more than one level. Uh, I experienced the death of my child. Uh, very, I was very conscious of, of the child's death. And then I, I remember experiencing like this mortal blow to my heart, to my soul. You should never view murder as an answer to any human problem. Um, it's not really up for us to decide. There are extreme cases, there are hard cases, um, such as rape, such as the mother's life is in danger, but I mean hard cases don't make good laws, and we've seen that throughout history. And I can tell you firsthand that I did get over the date rape, but I didn't get over the abortion. I think we do a great disservice to women who have the trauma and the horror of experiencing the violation of their person through rape. And then to offer to them a violation that's even greater. I think that people who say that they're pro-choice 
and say that it's okay if a woman can have an abortion or not have an abortion, it's still, it's not, it's not being open to life. So um, if, they ch if they see death as an answer, if they see murder as an answer, it doesn't seem like a choice to me. Reality sets in, there really was a person here. Did that person feel pain when they died? What would that person say to me now if they were looking me in the eye? Would they say, Mommy, I forgive you? Or, Mommy, I hate you? You know, those are real hard questions that a post-abortive man or woman has to answer. Taken from pro-abortion sources, approximately 42 million babies are terminated each year worldwide. That's 115,000 a day. In the U.S. alone, approximately 3,700 babies are aborted every day. And for anyone who thinks that beliefs don't affect actions, think about those statistics. If the general perception was that a fetus was a distinct living human being, would 115,000 be murdered every day? But then again, you know, maybe there are too many people to begin with. You know, maybe for the greater good, it's important you know, to keep our numbers down by whatever means necessary. You are not going to hear the truth ordinarily. A lie told often enough comes to be believed, and unfortunately, the media is lying to the American people. By saying, you know, we're overpopulated, we're all, there's going to be no more natural resources left, there's going to be no more food, there's going to be disease, there's going to be political unrest. Um, by st using all these scare tactics, they say, you know, leave it, leave it in our hands, we'll take care of it. So we put more trust in our government. Look at the facts, not the propaganda. Even the United Nations admits that by 2020 to 2025, uh, in the next 10 to 15 years, the Earth's population will crest, will stabilize at around six and a half to nine million people, and then we'll start dropping. Here's the big secret the eugenicist and the population control crowd doesn't want you to look at. Japan, for every two adults that were born, they're having less than 1.5 children. They're not even replacing themselves. Same thing in Italy, 1.3. There are some European countries where they're having 1.2 children, on average, for the population. Our world is definitely not overpopulated, and anybody can see that just by studying UN reports, by studying the, you know, the total Earth's land area, um, by studying fertility rates. There's um, Europe, uh, North America, um, all these places have a below standard, below sustainable fertility rate. So this is actually a crisis in the industrialized world. The industrialized world is dying. In places like Russia, abortion is so rampant that the number of abortions actually outnumber the number of live births. So they're in a huge population crisis and the government is actually giving their citizens huge um, monetary incentives to just have more than one child because Soon there won't be any Russia left to govern. It takes 2.1 children per family to reproduce uh, society. And so you go into a place like Germany, 1.4 children per family. Uh, Italy, France, 1.2 children per family, the same in Russia. All of these societies are dying off. And eventually, two or three generations from now, they will totally collapse. You have to have young people. Uh, coming into society to maintain a society, to maintain a culture, and America is in the process of, of suicide. The idea has first kind of came to media forefront in 1968 with um, Paul Ehrlich's book, The Population Bomb. He had a lot of doomsday prophecies and used a lot of scare tactics. Um, he said that we're going to breed ourselves into oblivion, that there was going to be massive world famines in between 1970 and 1980, and uh, it kind of it got uh, taken up by the media. It got taken up by you know John Rockefeller, Margaret Sanger, all these prominent societal figures. Um, and it scared a lot of people. And he obviously was wrong. There was no massive famines in between 1970 and 1980. And, uh, but I think that was the start of it, and it was grasped onto um, by Al Gore. And we see uh, Prince Philip, uh, Prince Charles' father, Queen Elizabeth II's husband, you know, constantly writing essays and publications talking about how we're a disease, there's too many humans, he wants to come back as a deadly virus to eradicate at least 80% of us. Whenever they talk about overpopulation, they, they zoom in on, you know, 
overcrowded cities and there's you know people filling the streets and or they zoom in on um, ch starving children in Africa and people listen to whatever the media tells them. Here in the United States we still pay farmers not to grow food. If we have a shortage of food why are we paying farmers not to grow food? We could produce all sorts of food. In fact there's an overabundance of food at the present time. The reason there's starvation in the in the world is because of the distribution of the food. According to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Association, there definitely is enough food. The, the world, they are producing enough food to feed the entire world. It's just not being rationed properly. If we were overpopulated and if famine was a real thing, then it would be difficult for the United Nations, for example, to argue that, uh, that we should be taking bread and uh, and edible grains and turn it into gas and put it in our cars. See, the, 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 there, there's a myth involved. 90% of the people live in one place, cities. And so, yes, when you're in a city, it looks crowded. When you go to the movie, there's a big line. When you try to drive to work in the morning, there's a bunch of traffic. We've all congregated together for commerce and business. I mean, that is the nature of what human beings do. Just because a place is overcrowded doesn't mean it's overpopulated. If you look at the entire land surface area that humans actually comprise, it's less than 3%. Um, there's been there was one study done that if you take the entire world's population and you give each person 1,100 square feet of land, that the entire population could fit into the state of Texas. And the world is a lot bigger than the state of Texas. What evidence do I have that the world is not overpopulated? Simply flying across America and looking at America. And I mean, there are vast parts of land that there's just nobody living in. The benefit of an increased population means you can have specialists. Some people can be planting the crops. Uh, other people can be studying science and developing mathematics and, and uh, a literature, alphabets. Uh, you can have other people who are able to develop medicine and other technologies and so it was human population expanding and the need to answer those questions of increased population that has propelled and driven human development in the last 6,000 years. It's worth repeating. How we perceive the world determines how we think and act. For example, how we think about babies and contraception and many government policies will be different if we believe the world is overpopulated rather than underpopulated. The actual truth about the population isn't affected by our belief one way or another, but the way that we interact with others and our world is. If you're about to meet someone new and someone says to you, hey, be careful because they're a thief, well, you're going to behave very differently around them than if something else had been said. Cultural stereotypes work this way, and no matter how much evidence you might find to the contrary, that image will persist. Greedy and generous as terms um, turn out to be, even though people deny it, evaluation of people's souls. It is something that is usually stated for political or ideological reasons or for advancing oneself or one's country. Truth is, a lot of uh, corrupt governments in the last hundred years have resented our free market. They've resented our Bill of Rights and Constitution. And so they've attempted to demonize the United States uh, so that uh, their populations don't try to emulate our system. When people have a perception, there has to be some core kernel of truth, and certainly that's the case. But at the same time, some of that perception is whipped up in those countries, especially when you go to a lot of third world countries run primarily by dictators. They don't want to point to their own problems. They don't want to say that their government has failed, so they point to various American transnational corporations or to the American population or to the American government. Liberty and freedom, property rights, the rights to practice your religion, uh, the right to not having your home invaded by the government, uh, the Castle Doctrine, the Fourth Amendment, that is America's greatest export. Freedom is the engine of wealth. What superpower has acted like it in human history? American foreign policy is not always to be approved of. But compare it to what, the Soviet Empire, the British Empire, the Persians, the Greeks, everyone in the past. But America, 
uh, greedy? Not particularly. So there's a work ethic in the United States that, that uh, it is different from many other parts of the world. So it's very easy and convenient to, to, to attack the US, largely because they won't hit back very much. Now, try doing that, in other, try going to Iran, for example, and, and saying, um, you're corrupt, you're sadistic, you're hateful, and see if, how long you last in the center of Tehran saying that. The American dream is something that is uniquely American. Uh, studies have been shown that even Europeans tend to agree that Americans tend to be more optimistic about their future than they are. And so as a result, because Americans tend to be entrepreneurs, I think it's part of our American DNA. Arthur Brooks points this out in his latest book called The Battle, in which he says, think about it, America is just full of immigrants. Well, immigrants are people that are risk takers. They were willing to leave their home country, come to this country and risk it all for the possibility of prosperity. And they believed in the American dream. They also let flourish a system of capitalism, which, uh, basically says that, that this, these twisted human beings are gonna be out for their own. They're gonna, they're gonna want things. They're gonna want a bigger piece of the pie than the other guy. That looks ungenerous. It looks like individualism. But most people have this moral individualism. There is no other nation per capita that contributes as much to Haiti. Billion dollars. People in the United States contribute, not corporations, not foundations, not bequests. Five. $195 million a day. One of the things we hear all the time are that Americans are greedy and self-centered, and yet if you look at the facts, just the opposite. Don Eberly was on my radio program a while back, and he talks about the civil society, and he runs the numbers and shows that Americans are the most generous people in the world, bar none. It's easy for Americans to toot their horn, but a lot of foreign uh, anthropologists and sociologists have noted that in the last 230 plus years of this nation's history, that Americans have been some of the most charitable uh, and helpful people in the world. Even when the United Nations regularly criticizes the United States. So through the United Nations, when it has resources for aiding children or providing resources when it comes to uh, natural disasters or famine, uh, a lot of that is simply provided by the donations of the United States. We also have remittances. Remittances are the money and sometimes goods, but mainly the money that immigrants who are working in the United States send to their back to their homeland, largely to their families and close friends. And they think now it's close to 100 billion a year. It turns out that that is the highest source of foreign currency of dollars in Mexico. So this is dramatic across the seas. And when you think about charitable giving being 300 billion, about 225 billion being from individuals, and now we have another 100 billion to add to that. People who haven't achieved sometimes, not always, but sometimes resent those who have achieved. Countries that haven't achieved even more frequently resent those countries that have achieved. And you have to ask, how would they behave if they had even a, a third of the power and wealth and influence of the US? I've oftentimes said that the best foreign policy for America has been missionary activity. They're the ones that have helped build the roads, build the schools, build the churches, meet the needs. Many of them have been willing to die on the mission field in order to serve others. We actually still believe that we can offer the world justice, that we can offer the world truth, that in many respects we can offer the world salvation by sending missionaries around the globe. Now that's, that's certainly pulling back in our, in our own time, but nonetheless it's still there. And a people in rebellion against God aren't going to appreciate that for a minute. Do you base your beliefs about the world on your own experiences and verifiable facts, or do you base it on what you're told, your own biases and a wishful sense of how the world should be? because we all want to seem objective, most would say, on our real experiences and facts, yet certain generally accepted lies could not possibly exist if this were the case. It's amazing, personally, that Islam is framed as a religion of peace where there's so much uh, violence in conjunction with it. Uh, there are these uh, outbursts as in murders in Europe of individuals that, that criticize Islam. Islam is not religion of peace. Listen, don't take my words for it. 
you can know the, the tree from its fruit. Now, look around you today. Uh, uh, and the extremist movement and all the bombs and all the terrorist attacks and so on. Tell me, this fruit is a coming from a peaceful root or coming from violent roots? After 9-11, many, many people came on TV, many Muslims, uh, and they, uh, they stood up and said, Islam is a religion of peace. The word jihad does not mean war or violence. And uh, I'm very surprised about uh, their explanation because it really, it's, it's not true. When the word jihad is mentioned in the Quran, 97% of the time it's referring to war and uh, jihad is violent jihad, it's encouraging violence. Only 3% when the word jihad is mentioned in the Quran, it refers to non-violence. So you can say that Islam is a religion of peace and you're going to be right 3% of the time. There are two views of Islam in the world. There is the view, there's moderate Islam and then there is extremist, jihadist Islam. And the, the popular myth is that the majority of Muslims are moderate Muslims. If you're going to use the Muslim definition of what is a good Muslim, Osama bin Laden is a good Muslim, and a moderate Muslim is an apostate. I have Muslim friends myself that I love them and they love me, but with my own respect, these people is not religious. And if they are religious, I really doubt if they can sit down with me knowing that I'm a Muslim converted to Christianity. Because according to the Quran, I deserve to be killed. Radical Islam and moderate Islam, this is something created in the West. In the Muslim world, we, we're either Muslim or not. I judge a religion but by what's written in its books and what, how it's interpreted by the learned men of Islam. Like any other group, many Muslims don't want to do jihad, don't want to kill anybody. And that doesn't mean that the verses encouraging them to do violence don't exist. They say that the extremists is not real Muslims. They are just using uh, the, 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 the name of Islam. I'm a lawyer by education. What you believe does not matter in the court, but what you can prove does, does matter in the court. Here's their Quran. This is their Quran. This is not the Bible. This is not a magazine. This is not a book uh, that I bought it from a uh, public library. This is the Quran. That's what they believe. Let's open this book. Let's read this book. Let's understand what they said. In Surah number 4, verse number 89, they say, uh, take the non-believers, wherever you found them, and kill them, and uh, take them and kill them, wherever you found them, and don't take from them friend or helper. I'm very surprised that we need even to argue about the, the violence in, in Muslim scriptures. It's clearly there, and it's over and over, and it's, it's everywhere. It's in the Quran, it's in the Hadith, it's in the Sharia books. It's an obligation uh, for every Muslim to do the jihad. Um, there are hadiths by Muhammad entrusting after he dies that it is the job of every Muslim to kill the Jews wherever you find them. Well, there's a passage in, in uh, the Quran that says uh, the day will come when the trees and rocks will shout out, O believer, there is a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill him. That's, that's a direct quote from the Quran. And the Meccan verses are the ones where don't take Christians and Jews for your friends because they're friends for each other and if someone won't, won't uh, convert, crucify him on his left hand and his right leg or, you know, that's where this kind of thing came from from the second half, what Salman Rushdie referred to as the satanic verses. Surah 5 be the fifth chapter there in the Quran, and in there you would run into the concept of jihad four times before you get even through the first 30 verses. And I think you could read for yourself what actually is said. The so-called verse of the sword is there and other passages that talk about making wide slaughter, uh, beleaguering your enemy, killing them. If a Muslim head of state does not rule by Sharia, if the Muslim head of state does not do jihad, which is a requirement under Islamic law against Jews, Christians, and pagans and nations, especially close nations that are non-Muslims, then that head of state is no longer a Muslim. The only time 
citizens can turn against a Muslim head of state is and kill him or take him out of office is if he does not rule according to Sharia. If you look at it historically, Islam has grown primarily through military engagement. If you look at it today, the State Department more recently issued about two dozen hotspots around the world in which there were terrorist activities. In every single one of those, Muslims were involved in these conflicts on one side, sometimes on both sides. Muslims even fight against Muslims. So to say that it's a peaceful religion, you have to reject all of its history and there's a lot of history that certainly was bloody, but you also have to turn a blind eye to the fact that most of the terrorists, not all, but most of the terrorists today are Muslims. Osama bin Laden has come to the fore to represent uh, the radical edge of Islam, and certainly we're not looking at peace there, we're looking at someone where there's a call to arms to take back the world, to take over the world, rather, and take, take back Islamic holdings that have left the fold, like Israel. I'm very passionate because I lived half my life in the Muslim world and half my life in the West. And I think I understand both societies very well. And I can see the danger coming here. Under Islamic law, for example, you're ob there is a law that states you, uh, it's obligatory to lie if the purpose is obligatory. Which means what? It means that a Muslim must lie. Not you can lie or you may lie. You must lie if it's for the benefit of Islam. A lot of people, they don't understand that today there is one persecuted Christian every three minutes worldwide. Just last year, over 165,000 Christians was killed for their faith. That's more than the tsunami victims. Between 200 to 300 million persecuted Christians worldwide. 80% of them in a Muslim countries. 80% of the persecuted Christians today in the Muslim countries. If a religion expands itself so much to become a one-party totalitarian system called the Ummah that has a very elaborate legal system that can put you to death if you leave it. And if that Ummah, which is the Islamic State, has a military institution called Jihad, then that system is no longer a religion. Because Islam is no longer just a relationship with God between a Muslim and his God. It impacts all of society. It oppresses women. It oppresses men because it demands from men to do jihad. And if they flee the front lines, they could be killed. Much as individuals have trouble seeing uh, Islam uh, seem the, the rougher, tougher edge of it. Governments, similarly, they don't want to go on record saying, you know, Islam is a religion that, uh, that presses people into service in ways that aren't healthy for human societies. They don't want to say that because who wants to speak out against, uh, you know, over a billion individuals and incur their wrath? There was always a, a separatist movement. Whenever Muslims go, the minute they become strong enough powerful enough to demand separate laws for Sharia, if they are not given what they want, violence will erupt on the streets of that country. They will blow up theaters, schools. I call it the Chechnya syndrome. We can have a Chechnya in France in 10 years. We can have a Chechnya in England in 20 years. We can have a Chechnya in America in another few decades. And by that, I mean local civil war for independence to create an Islamic state in the heart of the West. The word bias is defined this way, a partiality that prevents objective consideration of an issue or situation. Basically, a person's preferred way of seeing the world, a bias, will impede their ability to see something for what it really is. Hitler and the Nazis were so biased against the Jews that they believed them to be subhuman. This meant that no matter what the Jews did to dispel this falsehood, the Nazis kept persecuting them. In our modern society, we like to think that we're above this and that with the global media, video cameras, and international agencies, the truth will come out. Yet somehow, even with all this, or maybe because of all this, bias still overpowers the truth.
The argument that Jews stole Jerusalem is just a popular mythology. It's not borne out by any assessment of history. My people, the Arab people, have committed an atrocity against the Jewish people. It's been going on for 1,400 years. And it's, it's a disgrace that the world doesn't see it yet. When Israel came into its own in the 1940s, uh, in response to a UN mandate, which was carved out on the basis of Jews having bought so much of this land from Arab peoples anyway, various uh, nations mobilized forces to destroy her. They did it in the Independence War and in subsequent wars, and they never were successful. In fact, Arab armies were humiliated. Being unable to defeat the Jews militarily, let's do it propaganda, let's in a more subtle way, begin to vilify the Jews, to marginalize them, to claim they're bad people, they're thieves. And there's a war that's been fought now in public opinion for years. And the net result is that being unable to beat the Jews militarily, now through media, well, you know, maybe, maybe the Jews don't really have this, even though it's crazy. And after hearing it a million times that the Jews stole you know, the Holy Land from the, the Arabs who were the rightful heirs, people just assume it's true because they hear it all the time. It's not the cause celeb to criticize Saudi Arabia or Egypt or some of those other oppressive regimes that are clearly a lot more draconian uh, than any other country in the region. Uh, it's popular to bash the United States, it's popular to bash Israel, uh, and then people just really aren't fair uh, about looking at what's going on in some of those other nations because it's, it's just absolutely horrible. Israel begins with a deck stacked against it, uh, the deck stacked against it. You have um, 22 countries roundabout and 50 or 70 countries in league with them. So whatever Israel does, Israel's going to be castigated. Look at the map of the Middle East. Can you see Israel? You can hardly see Israel. This is not a problem over land. And there's a very prominent sheikh in Egypt, who's very anti-Semitic, who agrees with me. And he says, this is not about the land in uh, this, the conflict with the Jews, not about, it's not about land. It's because we must annihilate the Jewish people in Israel. This is the holy war. He's frank enough to admit it. Jerusalem is a Jewish city. It belongs to the Jews and Muslims cannot tolerate to see that. Jerusalem's been there for a long, long time. And Jerusalem was there before Islam was here. There's archeological record, all of which predates the Islamic conquest. The notion that, that the Jews just took this from Islamic peoples is just, it just can't be taken seriously historically. It's just popular rhetoric substantiated by no facts. If you go to the Bible, you can see very quickly that the Bible says that this was land given to Abraham. You can go to Genesis 12 and other passages to certainly establish that. You can also establish that Jews lived in the land. They had the Old Testament theocracy which was there. After the Babylonian captivity, they came back. Jews were in the land until 70 AD. The history of Jerusalem, archaeology, various literary records, uh, it is well substantiated, the biblical record to be sure. Muhammad's own record is we're looking at uh, someone born in 570 AD. That's hundreds and hundreds of years after Jesus who was in Jerusalem, by the way, in Jewish hands with a Jewish temple and a Jewish elite. Jerusalem is mentioned in the Bible 737 times. It's mentioned in the Quran, zero. The, you know, the, there's a, the, the connection between the Jews and Jerusalem is as direct as the word Jew and Jerusalem. When they conquered Jerusalem, they picked the holiest of the holy areas of the Jews, the ruins of their temple, and went there on top of the temple, the Temple Mount, and built a mosque. That mosque was built 100 years after Muhammad died. And with that mosque, they hoped to seal the memory, any Jewish hope of reviving this Temple Mount and rebuilding it again. That tells you who conquered who. 
who took the holy land of another nation. So the focus of a lot of the Muslim world is removing the Jews from that land of Israel. They don't want a two-state solution. They don't want Jews and Muslims living side by side. They don't want a temple to be built on what was called the Temple Mount or where the Dome of the Rock is. They want Jews to leave entirely. I was brought up thinking that Jerusalem was a Muslim city and some foreigners calling themselves Jews came and just occupied it. Unfortunately, the, this is a huge lie that, uh, that many Muslims have accepted and live with it. Until fairly recently, you could go to the website for the Palestinian Authority. When you look at their map, all it has is Palestine. It had no place at all for Israel. So you can see that their goal ultimately is to remove the Jews from the land. What is the goal of the Jews? Well, they just want to live in peace. And they have been, over the years, been willing to give up land for peace, whether it's the Golan Heights, whether it's Gaza, whether it's been even things happening in the West Bank. If Palestinians were interested in peace, things would be a little different. For instance, as an extension of, of wanting peace, uh, Israel gave the Gaza to uh, the Arab peoples. And what came in, result, in response to that? Thousands and thousands of rockets. Uh, similarly, in the West Bank area, Bethlehem and its environs, it seems that when you give uh, land for peace, one would hope to get peace in return. But the record says, no, that's not the case. Whenever I see a temple, or a, ten uh, a temple, the words are all justice, peace, mercy, uh, compassion, uh, shalom. How can, what can we do to make peace with the Arabs? That's all I hear from Jews. When you go to attend a mosque, Muslim mosque service in Saudi Arabia or Egypt, or Syria or any Muslim or country, all you hear is we're gonna annihilate the Jews, we're gonna destroy the Jews, and we, 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 we're gonna end their existence. Why doesn't the world take their word for it. On the popular TV show Seinfeld, George Costanza said, it's not a lie if you believe it. Bias is another way of expressing the same thing. Unfortunately, it also seems that if a lie is repeated enough, it too could become a truth. In schools, in movies, in children's books, in the news, just about everywhere, it comes up. The Earth is referred to as very old, yet no one ever seems to question where this assumed fact actually came from. Just because it's repeated everywhere doesn't actually make it true. Folks are a product of their culture. Uh, we've grown up with this from, from uh, you know, with the time we're three years old, we hear that dinosaurs died millions of years ago. That is the popular that's what, what, what the popular media says. Uh, in, in the smallest, in, in the, the, the earliest you know, preschool children's book, dinosaurs are talked of in terms of millions of years. We all believe what we get taught from authority figures. So it, from, from day one, all I was taught, dinosaurs are millions of years old, and, and the, the rock layers prove millions of years old, and, and radioisotope dating proves millions of years old. So it, it's just what you grow up with. On the media, always, they always speculate how it would fit in with evolution. And so they state it as a fact. 200 billion years ago, you know, and, and it really never has been a fact. Matter of fact is, there's lots of evidence that we're not old, we're a young universe. The Earth is incredibly, incredibly old, 6,000 years. But as I said, it's all relative. If you're used to hearing through the media, as we all are, that the Earth is billions of years old, when somebody like me, who believes the Bible, says, well, it's 6,000 years old, that just, it, it sounds like nonsense. It sounds like, you know, I was abducted last night or something like that. What's the point? I mean, why do you care how old this rock is, how old this fossil, how that animal got to be the way it is? But there are underlying meanings that go to the very core of our being that answer life's big questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? What's the meaning to life? What happens after I die? These big questions are answered by creation information. Atheists must have millions of years. See, if you're an atheist, you believe there's no God. If you believe there's no God, there must have been a way you came into existence without a creator. Well, that's evolution. 
we all recognize a fairy tale when we hear about the, fr the, 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 the princess who kisses the frog and poof, it becomes a prince. Right? That, we, know, we recognize that as a fairy tale. But if the frog turns into a prince over millions of years, people call that science. What is the biggest stumbling block for Christians and, and people in general to creation? Uh, what is the most powerful tool that Satan has at his disposal to, to lead to disbelief? And the answer was, of course, radioisotope dating. Stunning discoveries. Um, discoveries that the radioisotope decay uh, decay rate has changed over time and and certainly the the original conditions of a, of a rock what was it like when it was first birthed uh, did it already look old according to radioisotope dating well yes indeed usually they do radiometric dating is seen as the linchpin of of the evolutionary age of the earth they say oh all these radiometric dating techniques show the earth is ancient so how can you believe in a young earth well actually what i do is i i appeal to known lava flows you know go to hawaii sample a lava flow sample some basalt that's come out of the earth bring it back to your laboratory tell me what age you measure it's not going to be zero it's not going to be even a few thousand years old you're going to get an old age basically what they do is look at the sedimentary rock units in the jurassic layer and they find some dinosaurs there and they say because we find dinosaurs here this particular layer is at least 70 75 million years old and so it is a tautology where they date the fossils by the rock layers and they, they date the rock layers by the fossils that they find in them. And so it is a, a cause for circuitous or circular reasoning. Of course, Nova Scotia, uh, there's a place called Joggins there, very famous geological site. And of course, the highest tides in the world, the waters come in, the waters come out, and it erodes the cliff face. So you go to Joggins there sometimes, you can see trees standing upright. Uh, you know, as, as the layers come in this way. So they're standing upright, 30 foot tall trees through what would be considered millions of years of sediment. Well, how, how could you possibly have a, a dead tree standing here as the, the sediment came in slowly over millions of years? It's gonna, we know what happens to dead trees, you know, they dry out at the top and rot out at the bottom and they fall over. That thing got buried very, very quickly, rapidly, catastrophically. That sediment must have come in so quickly that the tree didn't rot and it actually fossilized. Now actually, uh, geology has swapped over, so where the millions of years are, are actually in between the layers where there's no evidence. So the absence of evidence becomes evidence of millions of years now. When you look deeper in the rocks, um, the layers are completely flat as a pancake. Uh, like in the Grand Canyon, you have the Coconeo sandstone above the Hermit Shale, and they're supposed to be 12 million years apart, and yet the contact is, is completely flat. And you have shales are very soft rock, so are they saying the shale was exposed to the elements for 12 million years and didn't look jagged at all, no, no erosion features to speak of? So that points to me that you've got uh, lots of rock layers being formed um, and deposited one on top of the other before the bottom layer had a chance to erode. They have used radiocarbon dating to date coal samples and virtually all coal samples measured to date fall within the error range, about 40,000 or so years. Uh, what's even more amazing is no matter what level you find the coal in the geological column, it dates out at about the same date. We have done carbon-14 dating on coal and diamonds, which are hugely old. Diamonds are supposed to be over a billion years old, and yet we find carbon-14 in them. Now, hang on, carbon-14 would have long just decayed if they were that old. One of the uh, discoveries that has really rocked the evolutionary world was made by Dr. Mary Schweitzer and Dr. Jack Horner uh, from analyzing the uh, interior uh, the bone marrow, if you will, uh, of the thigh bone or the femur of a T-Rex that was excavated back in 2003. Their report was published in the March-April uh, 2005 edition of Science Magazine, a very prestigious, peer-reviewed Science Magazine. They reported soft, stretchable, elastic, snapback like a rubber band tissue in that thigh bone. In addition, they reported finding red blood vessels, uh, blood vessels that still had blood cells in them that were identifiable and all of that would be impossible if this dinosaur died out 65 to 68 million years ago. Clearly science has shown this dinosaur died out very recently. The other things like um, the comets 
because comets lose mass every time they go past the sun and therefore if uh, they couldn't have been orbiting for more than about 10,000 years because they all disappear. In 1989 there was a probe that flew by one of Jupiter's moons called Io. Io I think is about one and a half times the size of the Earth and what the evolutionists are expecting to find in these moons is that they're old, cold and dead. Old, cold and dead. That's, they're 4.6 billion years old. All of their geologic activity should have long ago dissipated. Io, it was discovered, has more than 80 active volcanoes. How can that be? And the amount of material that's being erupted from those volcanoes, if Io had been erupting at only 10% of its currently observed levels for 4.6 billion years, Io would have erupted its entire volume more than 40 times over. The more we learn in medical science about how the human body works, the more complex it becomes. Every time we answer something, a thousand new questions arise. The human body is unbelievably complicated. And I personally no longer believe in natural selection as being the explanation for evolution. Natural selection plus mutations are supposed to be the mechanisms that drive the change of one kind of an organism to another. And yet mutations, geneticists know, are damaging. Each new generation that comes along has between 60 and 175 new mutations. So we've got our parents' mutations and their parents and their parents and so on. That mutation rate is catastrophic. The natural selection explanation for evolution presumes trillions upon trillions, almost infinite numbers of mistakes <laughs> in, in, in reproduction for it to be true. And I, and I don't believe that in infinity, in, in knowing now, when Darwin developed the, the theory of evolution, there was a very simplistic thinking about what humans are made of. But now we know they're so complicated that that can't possibly be an explanation. And this is what geneticists are telling us nowadays. At the rate that the mutations are entering the human genome, we are deteriorating at a phenomenal rate. That's an evidence for a young Earth. It's an evidence that the human population did not evolve from apes millions of years ago. We'd already be dead. Are you still listening? Are you still willing to consider that the truth may not be what you thought it was? Well, if so, you're braver than many. Some lies are built through general repetition of false information. Some come through an unknowing bias and prejudice, while others may come through an intentional attack on something that could hold us accountable to a higher power. The age of the Earth isn't just a debate about how old a piece of rock is. It's a debate about our origins, about how we got here, and ultimately, why we're here. I've edited a philosophy journal for over a decade, and I've entertained articles from some of the top theists and atheists on the planet. And I've become convinced of one thing after reading article after submission after article after submission and publishing these things at a very high level and seeing them argued and articulated at the highest levels. Uh, God exists. There's just, there's just no way around this idea. If you want to be a rational person, God exists. And you've got to acknowledge that. A lot of different reasons uh, why God might not just reveal himself. I think people have this assumption. It, it's almost this arrogance that, well, you know, God should just do what I want him to do. Well, God's God and you aren't. <laughs> He's sovereign, you aren't. Uh, it, Romans 1.20 says there is ample evidence for everyone on this planet to know that there's a God. When I meet an atheist, someone who professes atheism, I say, so you're an atheist? He says, oh yeah. So you believe that nothing created everything, a scientific impossibility. He says, no, 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 no. So you say something created everything, it just wasn't God. Yep, that's it. Do you think this something was intelligent? He says, oh yeah, because we can't create a flower, a bird, or a tree. In fact, the most intelligent person on the face of the earth can't create a grain of sand, a leaf, a flower, a bird, a frog from nothing. We can recreate, but we cannot create. That's God's business. So this person who's now backslidden from nothing created everything to something created everything isn't an atheist once again. He's agnostic. He believes something created everything, he just doesn't know what the something is. 
the Bible says that uh, the invisible things of creation are visible unto them that are created so that thou art man or without excuse. We, we really don't have any, uh, any logical or solid argument against the existence of God except that we can't find him. You know, we just, you know, we don't see him. It's like arguing that the, the air doesn't exist because we can't see it. In order to say that there is no God, you need to have absolute knowledge. Because what if God is hiding out in the center of Pluto and you just haven't come across him? It makes sense logically of what the Bible talks about when it says that his invisible attributes, God's invisible attributes can be clearly seen in what has been made. So we can look at the order of the seasons or the way that the human body is designed and we can attribute those to someone intelligent. It, it demands uh, a, a designer. When we look at the level of design, we can see that that argues for some kind of intelligent prime mover and creator. Whether we look in the microscope in the small dimensions of life and look at all the fine tuning in the biological world, or whether we look at the universe in a telescope and the fine tuning in the universe, we recognize again that there is just too much information, too much design. When we look at information itself, uh, it has always been shown to come from an intelligent source. For example, if there was a blackboard behind me and I took the chalk and I wrote on the board, hi, my name's Calvin, where did the information come from? I mean, if I take all the, rub off all the chalk, is there any information in chalk? There's no information in chalk. So the information came from an intelligent mind, hopefully. <laughs> information itself is a non-material component of this world that is very hard to explain from an atheistic point of view. Where did the information come from in all living things? All living things have DNA. It's a code system. It's a language system. They actually admit that code systems would be signs of intelligence, for example, when they put the SETI project together, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, because they're listening for what? They're listening for a message. And, and what they're arguing is, well, if we receive a message, we'll know there's intelligence out there. But then they look down their microscopes and they see the most sophisticated code system we've ever seen. Bill Gates himself says it's like a computer program, except far more advanced than we'll ever be able to put together. And they say, well, it just happened by chance. Well, that's not rational. I am a walking collection of supercomputers, more, more technologically advanced than anything we can even dream up. Ridiculous to, to argue that, that a, you know, a, a computer just evolved someplace. But we're infinitely more complicated than a computer and infinitely more delicately programmed. Here's their argument. We've got a team of absolutely brilliant scientists, the best minds in the world, and we're going we're gonna to create life in a lab to prove that it didn't take intelligence to create life. Uh, that's not a really intelligent argument, is it? There are other clear and compelling evidences of God. For instance, the, the idea that, that we have a, such a compelling and strong sense of morality, the idea that we know what's right and wrong, and we do know it. Where in the world did that come from? There's no possibility of explaining that moral awareness of human beings by referring to naturalistic evolution or some strange cosmic accident. You don't get a concept of morality from static nature, from a meaningless nature, from, from time and from chance. You get morality from a moral being or a moral mind. And that would be God. Human beings, for example, have a mental capacity which is so far beyond whatever is required for them to adapt to the problems of eating and keeping warm, you know, digging ditches and growing potatoes, that's all you need. You don't need a mind which is able to come up with um, Einsteinian theories in physics and to fly uh, spaceships to Mars and, and to develop uh, vast and beautiful works of philosophy, extraordinary pieces of literature and music and all these things are way beyond whatever might be required by a theory of simple adaptation. A lot of people point to the fact of suffering. Um, there's suffering in the world, that proves God doesn't exist, which is ridiculous. Suffering proves that the Bible is right. The Bible gives a reason for suffering. We live in a fallen creation. When God created man in the beginning, there was no disease, no pain, no suffering, no death, no dentists. Everything was just perfect. But then man rebelled against God, and with the fall came death, and suffering, and pain, and disease. And all these things aren't evidences to reject God. There are very real reasons why we should accept the biblical reason for our fallen creation.
Ultimately, we can look at the Bible that transcends time. No other book dares to do such a thing. If you want to get to know God, I would say open up the scriptures, the Bible, and dare to make that step and read the text for yourself. You've got historical records, you've got documents you can study, you, can got the, you have the things that they record in, in their, their holy writings, so to speak, and you can test them. Empirically, you can test them. Archaeologically, you can test them. Historically, you can test them. Logically, philosophically, many, many things, and that's why I believe Christianity is the most rational faith. I did my doctoral work in religious studies, so I got an opportunity to study all of these great world religious traditions from stem to stern. And it was clear and compelling to me that only one had any shot at, at providing that moral measuring stick. And that would be Christianity because it was the, the most compelling religion that said we can know that God exists and that he truly has spoken. Well, the Bible was written by 40 different men. They're composed of 66 different books. Most of these guys never met each other. And yet, when the, when the Bible is brought together, it reads as if it was all penned by the same guy. In fact, there are references in one part of, part of the Bible to somebody else in another part of the Bible, and he wasn't even born yet. Or events that uh, one prophet will talk about that will be the result of events that another prophet down the road says is going to happen later, and then it does. The Bible's proof in and of itself is the Bible. It's the most studied book of all time. It's been studied continuously for, for thousands of years. Uh, the, the Bible is amazing because imagine if you had uh, a group of people from the same background, they grew up in the same area, and had them separated and have them write a paper on one controversial topic, such as the meaning of life. Would their papers agree? Of course not. And yet the Bible isn't just one controversial topic. It's not written by people in the same time, in the same town. It's written over three continents. It's written over a span of more than a thousand years by people from many different backgrounds. Royalty, servants, people in jail, people on a ship, people in all different areas. And it's a seamless unity. I think that's one of the greatest evidences that there's a God. Think about this. In the last 2,000 years, how many wise men, smart guys, uh, intellectual scholars uh, sat around and debated the Bible and whether or not it's true and how could it be true. And the guy that found that one thing that he could point to and say this conclusively disproves the Bible would be the most famous man who ever lived because this guy would have single-handedly ripped the underpinnings out of the Judeo-Christian Judeo ethic. And in all those years, all those debates, all those councils, all those arguments, all those brilliant guys, university discussions, all of that, it stood every single attack. No one has ever disproved a single thing in it. That's pretty, that's pretty impressive. One of the greatest proofs that the Old Testament and the New Testament are valid is that what they say about Jesus Christ actually occurred. When you look at the prophecies in the Old Testament that point to Jesus, they were fulfilled in him in such, such an, a detailed, accurate way that it could not be coincidence. What God said, Way back uh, in the book of Isaiah, he said, bring together all of your gods of wood, hay, and stubble. Bring them together and have them tell us what's, what will the future bring? What, what, what is to come hereafter? And if they can't even do that, then what are you doing worshiping them? God says that I am God and there's none like me telling the end from the beginning and from the ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying my counsel will stand. I will do all my pleasure. And so <laughs> we have that historical statement and then we have 3,000 years of history that show that that historical statement is not only true, it's been, it, it, it was true in advance. All of the things that are taking place now were prophesied in the past. And as these events unfold, you have to ask yourself on a daily basis, wow, was that a good guess? How many good guesses do you have to take? But as I see what's going on today, and I read the scriptures, and I see the prophecies of the things that would come to pass in the latter days, and point after point after point is really coming to pass. It was prophesied 2,000 years ago that the, uh, the children of, of Israel would return to the, to the Holy Land. Now, there is no other race of people, you know, in the last 2,000 years that's reconstituted itself and returned to their ancestral home other than the Jews. I mean, it was prophesied that the language would be Hebrew. Hebrew was pretty much a dead language. 
but it's the language of Israel today. If we have a, a package, Christianity, the Bible, that's consistently correct throughout, it describes history correctly, been verified by science, been verified by archaeologists, I'm comfortable basing my life on its teachings and on the teachings of Jesus Christ because it describes reality and it's supported by what I can see around me. So now the more we know about physics, the more we know about chemistry, the more we know about astronomy argues for a creator God. The truth is not based on popular opinion or bias. One plus one equals two. A million people could argue with you that it's three, but the answer, well, it still would be two. The truth is not based on who perceives it. The most brilliant people in the world could say it was three. The answer would still be two. The truth is not based on feelings or trying to be nice. If the answer of two offended someone, well, it still couldn't be changed to three. The truth is exclusive. The answer can only be two. It can't be both two and three or any other number other than two. Now, many might believe that a belief in a religion is based on feelings and superstition and neediness rather than what is real. But if there actually was a God, wouldn't it make sense that God would be the source of all that is true? Wouldn't it make sense that he could never lie? And wouldn't it make sense that his claims could be tested and verified? And if he existed, wouldn't you want to know? Jesus Christ is certainly the best contender for uh, the savior of humankind. There's no, no question about it. And I've had the opportunity to study all of the great world religious traditions and, and Jesus is a standout. Everybody wants a piece of Jesus. Everybody wants to know him. Everybody wants to co-opt him, which is interesting. Think about it. Uh, Hindus, many Hindu people believe that Jesus is some sort of uh, avatar of Vishnu. Many Buddhists believe that Jesus is an is, a, is either a reincarnation of the Buddha himself or a great bodhisattva. Even in Islam, Jesus emerges as a figure greater than Muhammad himself. I mean, in the, in the Quran, Muhammad is spoken of as a great prophet. Well, so is Jesus. So it's kind of one-to-one -one at that point. But Jesus was also born of a virgin, was a miracle worker, and will you know, stand with Allah at the uh, scales of judgment at the end of time. If Jesus really is the one everybody wants to get hold of, if you're a spiritual seeker, why not start with the religion that has him, that is Jesus, firmly planted at the center? And that would be Christianity. There are certainly all kinds of support for the validity of scriptures. Uh, one theologian has said there's actually more um, indication that Jesus walked the earth than there is that Caesar walked the earth. But nobody doubts that Caesar walked the earth. Outside of the Bible, Josephus wrote about, uh, mentioned that Christ was a historical figure. Tacitus and another guy named Pliny the Younger. In fact, Pliny even said that Jesus was worshipped by Christians as God. Flavius Josephus was a Jewish historian who wrote a book, Antiquities of the Jews, wherein he referenced Jesus, saying, now concerning this man Jesus, if it be right to even call him a man, and he goes on to underscore his uh, death on the cross under Pontius Pilate, and he goes on to give voice to the movement that came in his wake. Oh, Jesus certainly existed. You've got to be uh, very far on the historical margins of scholarship uh, in order to come up with the idea that Jesus didn't exist. Even the most radical biblical scholars and historians uh, believe that Jesus certainly existed. It's not too far off to say that it's a historical certainty that Jesus lived and died at the hands of a Roman execution team in first century Jerusalem. Now, Jesus did things like uh, there was the roof was ripped off of a crowded synagogue one time and it was crowded with people. I mean, there were flesh and blood real people that were in there and they had to rip the roof off to lower down a guy on a stretcher so that Jesus could heal him in front of all these people, yet there's not a single word saying it didn't happen. Not, not by the Romans. <laughs> Any references that Romans have to Jesus say Jesus was real. Every reference that the Jews have to Jesus say Jesus was real. Every historical reference. The, the, the mere fact they mention him sort of suggests maybe he was real. The people that saw it, people that were there, witnessed what they saw and said, yeah, it's what happened. 
All four of the Gospels were published in Jerusalem first. I come across people who say Jesus was just a good man. I would say, did you ever read his claims? He was executed for claiming to be God. People called him God. He never denied that. Um, he was either God or he was a liar. Neither of those things are compatible with being just a good man. So I would hold that the, the, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then what flows from that doesn't give us the option that Jesus was just some nice teacher. Like, how in the world did just a nice teacher get crucified? How did such a nice teacher create such an imp incredibly powerful movement where people are getting fed to the lions in just a few years for believing he rose again from the dead? It just doesn't add up to me. He performed miracles. Who can perform miracles but God alone? He predicted the future. Who can predict the future but God alone? You see, not only did Jesus claim to be these things, but he proved it by accomplishing these tasks. No other individual in the history of man can do such a thing. He made claims to be God and he demonstrated by coming back from the dead. And I believe the resurrection of Jesus is, is probably the one of the best known facts of the ancient world. You can know that to be true. And if Jesus came back from the dead, there's, there's excellent reason to believe his claims about deity. The key event of the life of Christ that proves that he was the Son of God was his resurrection from the dead. The Apostle Paul said that Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection. In fact, he went on to say that if Jesus Christ wasn't raised from the dead, then our faith is futile and we're still in our sins. The mere fact that Christianity itself exists is powerful, powerful evidence because it would have been very easy if the resurrection hadn't occurred for the, the Jewish leaders to just go and open up the tomb and say, look, there he is, he didn't rise again. But before the, the resurrection, you've got these, his disciples cowering in fear, and then after he reveals himself, they're out, I mean, risking their lives. You know, you're facing uh, crucifixion or to be thrown from the pinnacle of the temple or uh, to be uh, run through with a lance or to be sawed in half or boiled in oil. These are all different, different uh, uh, penalties that these apostles faced and they willingly accepted that without a single one recanting, not one. If that was just a myth that was perpetrated, those who perpetrated it would have folded under the pressure that it was imposed upon them. The fact that these people stridently, boldly, vociferously went to their graves attesting to a risen Lord says something about the nature of the experience and the effect that it had on those individuals. And then what came after as well, too much energy unleashed in all of this, to my way of thinking, to relegate it to just some popular mythology of the times. If you were to take all of the books written in a, in a scholarly vein since, say, 1975 or 1950, you can even really go back a couple hundred years if you want, and you collect all of the data that even the harshest critics of Christianity uh, think is true about these purported resurrection events. He died by crucifixion. They think that there was an empty tomb involved in the story. They think that the disciples uh, had what they believe were literal appearances of the risen Jesus in front of them. Uh, that the disciples were transformed from doubters who were afraid to identify themselves with Jesus to bold proclaimers. When you add all that up, there's only one way to explain the historical data, and that is Jesus came back from the dead on the third day, exactly as the scriptures des uh, describe. There's the story of transformed lives. Uh, one can read of Aesop uh, and learn of moral stories and various fables and the like, but there's something about Jesus. We live in a world today where millions and millions and millions of people have received him and claim to be transformed by virtue of their so doing. Again, uh, this is the work of more than just a man. That happened to a man named Lou Wallace. He was walking the streets of London apparently many years ago as an atheist with a friend and they said, let's just, let's Let's discredit and disprove Christianity. And so he embarked upon a two-year uh, work to try and discredit Christianity. And after two years of studying the New Testament, Lou Wallace dropped to his knees and said to Jesus Christ, my Lord and my God. And then it went on to write that epic uh, uh, book, Ben-Hur, which was made into a wonderful uh, movie. Jesus is the only 
God that came on earth to sacrifice for me. There is no religion in this world that God himself sent his son to die for me. And as he dies for me, I will live and I will die for him. The power of God is what transforms a sinner so that you can say with a slave trader, John Newton, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I had come to become a follower of Jesus Christ when I was 17 on a bed of suicide in Delhi. Changed my whole life dramatically. Hopefully one day, why you will, of course, make that step of faith that I did uh, almost 50 years ago, and it changed my life forever. A while back, Erwin Lutzer was at this religious conference in Chicago, and it had all sorts of different tables, you know, Buddhist and Hindus and Zoroastrian and all sorts of different people of different religious views. What he did was he went up to each table and said, does your religion have a sinless savior? It's a good question, because what he found is that nobody had a sinless savior. They talk about, well, no, but our founder is a way shower. He shows you the way to God, or he provides you with peace, or he gives you enlightenment. But he kept them on that question. Does your religion have a sinless savior? None of them do. I have a love for God, and I love God because he first loved me, and he revealed himself as truth to me. We can accept it or we can reject it. It's up to you. But it doesn't change the reality that there's only one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ.